So oh. Maria. <laughs> Hello Mona. <laughs> so nice to be here. It's great to meet you. <laughs> it's great, yeah. Thank you for translating my book. No, thank you for your book because <laughs> it's wonderful and thank it's you. provocative and it's uh, great for, for, it was great for me to read it and it was great for me to translate it. So thanks to, thanks to you. I'm honored to hear that. <laughs> How long did it take you to translate, by the way? I was just asking you oh, that. That's true. Um, two months and a half. Oh, wow. It was a bit in a hurry yeah. because the, the dates, uh, the deadlines were tight. Mm. But uh, it was, uh, it was great. It was great. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> so um, I, the thing, I, 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 when I was translating your book, I was, uh, uh, well, of course, you are compelled with all the hard truths or with all the hard realities you, you discuss in it, uh, female genital mutilation and sexual assault, uh, sexual violence, gender violence. So um, I was thinking that writing that should have been painful for you. So I was, I was wondering if writing that was also therapeutic, or therapeutic for you at the yeah. same time. So. Could you expand on that, on yeah. writing as therapy? Or? Yes. Well, you know, the book um, was inspired by an essay that I wrote in 2012 mm -hmm. called Why Do They Hate Us mm -hmm. for Foreign Policy magazine. Mm -hmm. And that essay was the first anything that I had written using all ten of my fingers after the casts were removed from my arms. So for three mm -hmm. months, both of my arms were in a cast from here mm. to there. And I, uh, I type with all my ten fingers. So when my arms were in a cast, I could only use one finger, you know, on a, on a touchpad. <laughs> so it was literally painful. It was very painful. And so, and this was the first time it was physically painful mm. to write with all 10 fingers. But at the same time, it was a great uh, place to pour my rage. And I'm a very angry person. I, I don't always come across it, publicly, but... In the book, I, it shows. Right? It shows. Anger is the definitely is the driver of my engine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, I, I put all of my my rage into that essay. Why do they hate us? And and that was therapeutic because I just wanted all the issues that we refuse to talk about to be there. And then the book became the bigger platform. But there were moments in the book where mm. I literally had to stop and just get up and walk away because it was love you. difficult to, to write. Yeah, I, the, I, I like the way anger shows in your work because you, you used to registers, right? When you uh, are angry, you are very colloquial. So it's like where the, most, uh, the strongest manifest of voice yeah. appears. And then you, you go to an objective register uh, when you are using statistics mm. or you are including sociological details, mm. things like that. So I like the anger part because I was angry as well. Yeah. I was angry at the situation of those North African and Middle Eastern women. Yeah. And I wanted to recreate that anger mm -hmm. for my readers, for, my, for the Spanish readers. Well, yeah. our Spanish readers, your Spanish readers. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was thinking how to do that because mm. you address the reader directly mm. and you use you. But in Spanish, we have two options to say tú or to say vosotras. Mm. And I said, okay, I want, to, I, I want to establish a dialogue, so I used to, it was yes. one of my devices, and I tried to be as literal as possible to show your angry, to act your anger, so yes. I would use swearing words, oh, because good. you use swearing words all the time. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> and this kind of thing, so yeah. I tried to be as literal as possible with the work. I, I'm glad it was, it was uh, possible to convey that. <laughs> yes, you do, I think. I, th I think uh, uh, I think it's, it stands out. Uh, I've been discussing this with my with my young students, and they 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 see that as well in your text. Yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> you wrote a, a prologue for the book, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, I don't speak Spanish or read Spanish, unfortunately. So I'm curious what you wrote in the prologue. Well, uh, I I just wanted to make the reader aware that the realities that you were discussing were still ongoing. Mm. So I just wanted uh, the reader to know that I have included some footnotes to update on those events mm. that you were actually discussing. Mm. And also to, to emphasize the fact that um, um, I was not trying to, uh, to, to, re to recreate any stereotypes associated to mm. the oriental woman, mm. so-called Muslim woman, oriental mm. woman. And that I was, in order to do so, I was trying to be as literal as possible, mm. as you, mm. as you saw, or as direct as possible. Mm. Uh, so it was just uh, my way of uh, showing respect mm. and uh, facilitating uh, mm. the, 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 your text for my readers. Oh, I, I appreciate that because, you know, one of, one of the biggest problems and, and challenges for me 
is that the book isn't used, of course it, it will be used, mm -hmm. isn't used by a right-wing Islamophobic movement you know, against my people. Hmm. Because I, I'm, I'm accused by some of my people hmm. of making us look bad, you know. Oh, you're just this... Hajuma. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And how could you do that? Yes. And, and you're just, you're, you're making us look... You exaggerate and you make... Uh, and uh, obviously I don't exaggerate. Everything I write hmm. in the book happened. And um, like you say, in, in your prologue, continues to happen. But it's, it's a, this is part of the dilemma. And I mentioned at, in, in my introduction hmm. to the book the dilemma of, of being a writer who comes from the different worlds that I come from, where you're constantly pulled by this direction and pulled mm. by that direction. The right wing, the misogynist, the left wing, all of this. So, so. I, I hope your readers, um, of the readers in Spanish, um, understand yes. that. I, I think they will. Good. I think they will. Um, uh, also, I was wondering if uh, writing the manifesto uh, in the book in, in English was a conscious decision writing in English instead of Fosha, instead of uh, yes. standard Arabic. Yes. And uh, if translating the testimonies included in your book, yes. if that was also difficult for you or was it challenging somehow? Right. Well, I wrote the book in English because I've been speaking and writing English since I was seven. Mm. Because I was born in Egypt and Arabic is my first language, you know, what we call a mother tongue. And But my family moved to London when I was seven. And you know, when you're a child, you pick up language very quick. So I picked up English in you know, a matter of weeks mm -hmm. almost, a couple of months, something like that. And I've been speaking and writing in English since I was seven. But at home, mm. uh, my parents would speak to my siblings and, and, and me in Arabic. So I, I understand Arabic, I speak Arabic fluently, uh, I can write Arabic, but I can't write Arabic as powerfully as I can write English mm. because English really took over when I was seven. So I dream in English. You know, people often ask you, what is the language you dream on? Uh, dream in? What is the language you think in? Because mm. that's your, your primary language. And I dream in English and I think in English, even though I'm fluent in Arabic. So um, I wrote the book in English because that's the language that I use all the time. And I recognize that that has left me open to accusations that... Ah, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Because, of, because you use an imperialist language. Well, yeah. Well, look, you are using... Why did you write in English if this is mm. about us mm. and this part of the book? Because this first came up with Why Do They Hate Us, the essay. the essay. So when I was asked this, I said, first of all, you who read my essay in English are exactly the kind of audience from the Middle East and North Africa mm. who I want to read this. You are a privileged, educated audience that have to understand that there are women in our part of the world who don't have your privilege and mm. you have to fight because they are unable in their situation to use any privilege or to use the same amount of privilege mm. that you do. So clearly you understood and you're, you're my intended audience. But then had I wanted to publish Why Do They Hate Us in Arabic, who would have published it? Nobody yeah. would have published it. Yeah. And as proof of this, my US publisher has tried to publish Headscarves and Hymens in Arabic and they have been unable really? to find any publisher who will publish my book. My That's book is banned thing. in Saudi Arabia, in the I UAE, in Kuwait, mm. and in Qatar. In, in the Gulf, it's only allowed in Oman and Bahrain. Mm -hmm. And in limited bookshops in Egypt, I am told, in my country of birth, I am told the book is put under a desk and you have to ask for headscarves and hymens. It's not in the shop window. It's not in the shop window. Yeah. So for the people who say, why didn't you write it in Arabic? Who was going to translate me in Arabic? And so now, so I wrote it because it's the language that I'm, I'm mm. able to express myself strongest in, but no one, would, no one wants to translate it in Arabic. And now because the book has been translated into 12 languages, but not my, my first language, so many people in the region have asked again and again, I, I need this in Arabic, I want this in Arabic, I want to give it to my mother, I want to give it to my sister. Mm. So I have asked, successfully, I have asked my US publisher for my rights in Arabic to come back to me, and they agreed. And I have two friends who've um, offered to translate it for free into Arabic, That's and so nice. I will offer it as a PDF for free. I don't want That's to make great. money from this, because I want it to be available in Arabic. Spread the word and spread the message. Yes, yes. That's great. Yes, so soon. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know um, when you were writing the book, were there any particular passages that were very difficult for you? Yeah, many of them. I mean, when you when you translate a book, you got very involved with the with the voice of the author. So um, whenever you need to describe things that you never believe you would have to describe because you you consider them unbelievable. 
um, it was difficult for this, especially all the parts about the female genital mutilation who were very, which were very graphic, were mm. difficult. The story of uh, Manal Asi, the mm. Lebanese woman mm. killed by her husband, mm. was ter terrific. Mm. Uh, and of course, the, the sexual assault you suffered on mm. uh, Mohammed Mahmoud Street mm. was very, that part was, but it was hard for me as well. Yeah, yeah. Because you, yes, you yeah. can feel it. You can feel the pain there. So those were the hardest parts, I guess. But all of it was hard. Yeah, I know. So I know. People write to me and say, I enjoyed your book. And I'm like, I, I don't know if enjoyed is the right word. Mm. It's difficult to enjoy a book like that. I don't know, because it's also liberating. Mm -hmm. Reading your book was very liberating. And I'm not, uh, I don't come from a, I don't have a Muslim background, mm. but... Uh, it's liberating to, to, to listen to such a powerful voice, such a provocative voice, such a, liber such a liberated woman as yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's pain, yeah. but it's relief at the yeah. same time. So yeah. I think we enjoyed your book. Okay. Well, I also hear from people that I just read your book and I'm so fucking enraged. I want to go out there and destroy something. And I say, good. Good. <laughs> go out there and destroy something. Destroy the patriarchy, please. Destroy the patriarchy. Yes. And also with uh, your sense of humor, which is great. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure many people are enraged by, yeah. by your vocabulary, your explosive vocabulary. Yes, yes. And say, fuck the patriarchy. Yes. But say, yes. Good, be enraged. Because yes. I'm enraged all the fucking time. <laughs> That's what yes, I'm saying. Yes, it's like, like they say on, uh, you know, on, uh, on marches, why am I still protesting this shit? Exactly. <laughs> so why? I love those signs with the older yeah. women holding it. They've been doing this for decades, right? Do you think the um, uh, feminist movement is uh, going, is increasingly... It's becoming a powerful force in the in the in North Africa and the Middle East right now as an organized movement. Um, you, have you seen changes in the last years? I, I've seen um, more kind of uh, smaller pockets. Um, there aren't um, organized movements per se, but I think that there are kind of several pockets of activism that are really important and um, necessary to look at. And I think one of the most powerful and exciting are Saudi feminists. Hmm. who tweet and have a massive presence hmm. on oh, social sure. media. And, and, you know, I think about a country, and, and you know because you translated my book, I moved to Saudi Arabia when I was 15, and I became the woman I am because of Saudi Arabia. Because you were traumatized by exactly. Saudi Arabia. Yes, traumatized into feminism <laughs> in Saudi Arabia. So this idea that Saudi feminists who, you know, perhaps of all the countries in the hmm. region are the most marginalized because there is actual gender apartheid. I call it gender hmm. apartheid. Racial apartheid in South Africa, which we all, which many of us remember, this is gender apartheid, and and you know physically um, set apart either through the enforced niqab for many women because it's often uh, decided by their families or in the segregation of the sexes that is decided mm -hmm. by the regime. So for women from that context to then basically invade and demand and claim their space and their voice on social media. Um, some sociologists call it an ele electronic unveiling. Electronic unveiling, yeah, I love that. Of, of women, you know. where So Sa some Saudi women have intentionally gone on social media and several years ago would post pictures of their face uncovered, which is a massive taboo. I mean, it, it doesn't sound like a big taboo in any other part mm. of the world, but in Saudi Arabia, it's a massive taboo. So they would go on social media and they would post pictures of themselves with their face uncovered. Now it's even more beyond that. There are some women on Saudi on um, social media who put their um, phone on selfie mode and they will walk through the street wherever they are in Saudi Arabia with their face uncovered and they will say, here I am, That's right. this is me, this is me, this is my name. And more recently there was a campaign of Saudi women putting their niqab on a grill and setting it on fire. Oh, that's very liberating. Right? Yes. It's kind of to echo what Iranian women have been doing when they stick their hijab on, you know, they take it off, mm -hmm. put it on the stick. On the stick. So when Rahaf escaped, and I didn't have a chance to talk about Rahaf in the book that you translated because it, it came out before she mm -hmm. escaped, but I mentioned her in my new book. When Rahaf escaped, to watch feminist solidarity for Rahaf on, by, by Saudi women and Saudi feminists was incredible. Incredible. They went to war for her. There is no other word to call this because the regime had their electronic cyber army you know, mm. that goes on there or the cyber army. Saudi feminists were incredible. So I think that we need to recognize that. 
and there have been other things, but I think the Saudi ones especially have been very impressive. I, uh, you will be happy because I included a footnote on Raha's story. Oh, good. On the version I'm so because glad. It, I, I was able to follow the story. Good. Uh, and uh, we had this uh, two years gap between yeah. your edition and the yeah. Spanish edition. I'm so glad. Good. Uh, and uh, it's um, uh, you mentioned the Sa Sa Saudi Arabia case, and it's it's, uh, it's what they call cultural exception or uh, uh, exception all the time. Yeah, it, and it's it's true. You put the, uh, actually you pointed out very clearly, and it's uh, something that not everyone in the West is aware of that. Uh, Whenever there is this kind of uh, news about Saudi Arabia, oh yes, they are able to 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 drive right now, women, because the regime has been so, you know, so generous oh, yeah. because they are special because well, yeah. they they are they are yeah. a different yeah. um, culture, yeah. and it's like uh, oh come on, come on, and and uh, it's 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 true that you pointed out that very clearly that yeah. it's there's not the regime that graciously. Um, had decided that, but this is, is the fight of all these women yes. uh, behind yes. uh, so many years fighting yeah. for that. Yeah, absolutely. This is why it was important in the foreword because, you know, um, I wrote the book in 2014, hmm. and um, while wh when I was told that it would be translated into Spanish, some things had changed. But for sure. me, one of the most outrageous things that had to be included in, you know, a foreword to update things was the fact that this this new crown prince, who is now the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia, yeah. Mohammed bin Salman, has fooled the West into mm. thinking he's an emancipator of women. That is bullshit. He's yes, not he's the modern <laughs> of the bunch. Yeah, he's just a younger version yeah. of an absolute hereditary monarchy. And the fact that he imprisoned 17 women's rights activists who for years have been fighting to lift the ban on driving, and not just the ban on driving, because the ban on driving is one manifestation mm. of a bigger system, and that bigger system is gender apartheid. They were fighting guardianship system, and the guardianship system is the foundation of Saudi patriarchy. So he put them in prison, and then six weeks later lifts the driving ban, so he is the hero, because the message is, we give you rights, yes. you don't take rights. So I think that it's really important for the world to recognize that there have been three generations of Saudi feminists who have been fighting you know, and no one is paying attention to them. But because of oil, because of weapons, because of the two holy sites for Muslims, the, the Saudi royal family, it, the Saudi regime has been incredible in its ability to silence the world. I mean, at least with South Africa. Hmm. Eventually it became a pariah state because people said this is racial apartheid. Some people call Israel uh, an ethnic apartheid state hmm. and they have imposed or have suggested boycott, divestment mm. and sanctions, the BDS movement, which I support, because mm -hmm. it's a non-violent movement to support Palestinians against uh, Israeli occupation. But you know, with Saudi Arabia, how does it get away with this shit? How is Saudi Arabia able to do this? So I hope my book goes some way to, to showing people that there are women and male allies on the ground who are fighting and no one is paying attention to them and we have to recognize and we have to show solidarity mm. to these incredible people. And, and they are mm -hmm. now standing trial, uh, facing ludicrous charges. So I'm, I'm glad that you conveyed this to the Spanish audience. Um, I don't know about, well, I'm, I'm guessing that in Italy, you know, because Italy belongs to EU and the EU sells weapons and the mm. EU benefits from business deals with the, the, the various regimes mm. that I mention in my book. So I consider my work very political. Do you consider your work as a translator very political? Yeah, I think uh, most of the actions we women take are somehow political. Yeah. So the decision to take off the headscarf is political. Mm. The decision of breastfeeding your kid in public is political. Yeah. And uh, uh, translating is definitely a political, can be a political activity mm. as well. And I'm not, uh, I'm following uh, critic Gayatri Chakrabortis Divak on mm. this. And uh, she would say that since writing is the creation of meaning, therefore it's connected to identity, mm. uh, creating the, the, the who you are through words. Mm. And if you don't, uh, if you are not too, too literal, you could be uh, neo-colonializing the person who's speaking, mm. especially if you are uh, discussing uh, post-colonial authors. Yeah or authors from other uh, non-Western world. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I, I was aware of that. I was in, uh, you would be, I would be betraying your, your translation mm -hmm. if I would be less direct than you are mm -hmm. or using the kind of expressions that you use. So I was very aware of that. Yeah. 
Good. No, the political is very important. It's very important. The personal, the political, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you tell me a bit about feminism in Spain? Because one of the things mm -hmm. that, that um, when I travel and I've taken the book to several countries and it's been, it's been translated in many languages, one of the things that I try to do as a way of preventing people from just using this book to feel good mm. about their lives and mm. their country and to point and say, oh, it's really shit for women over there. And we are to fine. Feel, yeah, very <laughs> self-congratulatory. Yeah. You know? But I, I always no tell them, you know, it's shit over here too. And you have things hmm. to fight over here too. There might be things that are of slightly less degree perhaps, but hmm. you can't come and rescue me and you can't come and save me because as I said, you know, we're fighting and we're gonna rescue ourselves. So can you tell me about some of the feminist issues here in Spain that I can connect with audiences um, and say, look, you know, you have these issues. I mean, I, I know hmm. of a few like the, the recent rape case where you, know, you had massive, yeah, where you had massive protests, but I'd love to hear more from you about feminist issues that perhaps could connect I with this book. Feminism in Spain, uh, I mean, there, there have been mobilizations uh, since last year, massive mobilizations for the uh, 8th of March. So large marches, general strike, feminist strike, mm. and uh, young people are part of this movement uh, all the time uh, since the very first moment. And I think it's very inclusive, uh, bringing mm. together different generations of mm. feminists. And even though uh, I think the, uh, the quality uh, is granted now at the level of rights, mm. uh, and we are witnessing that uh, the, the justice fails women yeah. when it, came to, it comes to protect them. Mm. Uh, we have seen that on, yeah. the, on the case you were mentioning, La Manada mm. case, that uh, we are seeing that the gender violence laws which we have mm. are not enough so uh, and the judge and the yes the judges are not prepared enough mm. in mm. order to protect these women mm -hmm. so this is a, a great fight we need to mm. to address uh, we are trying also i think as uh, well fe as feminist activists the teachers uh, we are trying to uh, make people aware of the fact that uh, uh, sexism is everywhere, basically. Mm. It mm -hmm. shows this patri patriarchy, is, mm. it's, it's hidden, but it's there. Mm. Mm. So uh, this is the kind of things we are trying to do, how mm. to um, reconquer, recover language, mm. uh, uh, take uh, all the sexist, ov sexist over overtones for mm. language, mm. Uh, prevent sexual harassment in the street. That happens here as of well, course, it happens everywhere. everywhere. So uh, this kind of things, uh, even though the, the quality, the, the right level is achieved, we need to, to, to conquer the, the mindsets. Yes. So yeah. this is the, the connection, I think, between our, I don't know, Visions, worlds. Yeah, patriarchy is universal. It's universal. It really it's is. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You, uh, on your on the very dedication of the book, on the very first page, you say that this is for girls all over the uh, the Middle East and North Africa. So, um, how can we, uh, as uh, well, I don't like to use the label Western. We'll mm. say Spanish readers. Yeah. How can we help you on that fight? How can we um, decolonize feminism? How mm. can we help you to decolonize feminism? Right. Well, I think, you know, often when I'm asked, and, and I mention in the book, when I'm asked, when I speak at various places, how can I help women in the Middle East and North Africa? I say, first of all, you can do nothing for us in our mm. own countries because we have to save ourselves. We're not asking to be saved, we're not asking to be rescued, and no one can save anyone anyway. Mm. You have to save yourself. And we are saving ourselves and we are fighting to rescue ourselves. But I say the best way that you can, you can help is to have your own fight locally, domestically. Mm. Fight and recognize that patriarchy exists. Mm. It's definitely there, it's universal. Because when you fight your domestic fights against patriarchy, you weaken patriarchy globally, you weaken it universally. But I think that when um, the political fight is especially important against your various governments, so here in your, your government, Spain, and, uh, and Spain being a part of the EU, I always want people in the so-called West to demand that their government stop selling weapons to our dictators, because this is how you hurt us. So you can't help us physically, directly, you can't save us, but you can mm. at least mitigate against some of the yeah. harm that our regime 
um, put that into the political agenda. Exactly. Mm. Start demanding that your government stop selling weapons to the Saudi regime, which uses those weapons in its disastrous war in Yemen, where it has, mm. I'm sure, um, uh, been complicit or guilty of war crimes. And this is the same regime that silences any dissidents and now has these women's rights activists in prison. Stop selling weapons to Egypt, to the Egyptian regime, mm. which is fill, filling jails with political opponents of every movement you can imagine. So I think this, this is it's such an important thing when, you know, when it comes to a country like Italy, where there was an Italian who was murdered in Egypt called Giulio Regeni. Mm. For a while, the Italian government, you know, made a big fuss, but, you know, it's gone all quiet now. And more recently, Italy, Spain, and all the other members of the EU came to Egypt and met with the, the leaders of the Arab League to talk about business deals, to talk about selling weapons, but primarily to talk about ways that our regimes can stop migrants oh, and yeah, refugees yeah. from coming. So there, there is now this, you know, big bond where mm. your governments want our regimes to act as the jailers yeah. of migrants and refugees. Stop all of that, you know, disrupt all of that. So there's nothing you can do for us personally and individually because we have to mm. save ourselves. But as, as people who um, must be responsible for our politicians and for the political systems that claim to represent us, you can have an effect. So go out there and demand that your governments are more accountable to you in the kind of relationship they have with our regimes. That's just beautiful. <laughs> Can you tell us something about your next book? Because I'd I know love to. <laughs> yes, actually, th three days before I came to Barcelona, mm -hmm. before I began my Spanish tour, I finished the copy edits of my new book. So it's just like congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's um, it's been a very intense process because I had to write the book very quickly because we wanted the the new book, which is coming out in September in the U.S., to come out before the election season begins in the mm -hmm. U.S. Because it takes such a long time for all the politicians in the US to campaign and, and all of that. So it's coming out in September and it's called The Seven Necessary Sins the seven for Women and Girls. And so I'm taking obviously the deadly sins, but um, I'm making them necessary. And obviously they're not sins, but I call them sins because these are attributes that patriarchy tells women and girls not to want or to do or to be. <laughs> and those sins are anger, attention seeking, profanity, ambition, power, violence, and lust. And lust. I write a chapter about each one of those because I believe that each one of those are necessary and important in what I call feminism in 3D. Mm -hmm. and, and the 3Ds are defiance, disobedience, and disruption of the patriarchy. So mm -hmm. each chapter is about how we can use those sins to defy, disobey, and disrupt patriarchy and I do so through personal, my own personal stories, as I do in Headscarves and Hymens, but through the stories of feminists around the world. So I write about feminists in Argentina, in Ireland, in India, in South Africa, in Nigeria, but not just feminists, because for me, I, I also talk about, in, in the new book, I talk about women and girls and the non-binary community mm -hmm. and the LGBTQ community. And, um, and I, I, I interchange the phases because when I talk about women in LGBTQ groups, of course, there are women who are also you know, lesbian, bisexual, or trans, and I'm, I'm in, an inclusive, as inclusive as possible, it's for cis women and trans women. But it's also about the non-binary community because this is about all of us who fight patriarchy. Yeah. And I consider each one of those sins as something powerful to use against patriarchy. So this is what the book is. To fight uh, the fact that uh, those, all those bodies, trans bodies, bi bodies, uh, yes. women bodies are used as uh, po proxy battlefields, yes. as you as you are always mentioning. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <again. laughs>